What? Listen to this podcast right now! Hey. Do you want to hear a fucking podcast about anything and everything? Yeah. Like movies, oh my music, God. television, and more? Oh my God. Well, you've come to the right place. Yes. Subscribe to Journey Into Comics Network, oh. and you get Podcastrophy, oh hosted God. by me, yes. Dick. Why not throw a couple bucks to the Patreon? It's your yes. choice. Yeah. This is a Podcastrophy. That sounds so awesome. The following, following. the following is a journey into comics. Journey into comics. A journey into comics. A journey into comics. Journey into comics. Journey into comics. Network. 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 Production. Production. To a nicer guy, it couldn't happen. I'm the man of the hour. The man with the power. Diamonds are forever. He put hard times on Dusty Rhodes and his family. And what you gonna do, Andre? History beckons the macho man. Yeah. The best there is. The best there was. Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. Two words for you. Two words. And just a man. The champ is here. Do I have everybody's attention now? What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode of Journey into Wrestling. It's season three, episode 14. I am your host, Nate. Hope everybody is having a fantastic Wrestling Wednesday. So, you guys, lots has happened in the past two weeks since we last talked. And I mean, a lot has happened by way of there's AEW news, there's WWE news, there's possible returns, there's people talking about their private lives and things that have gone on, there's new champions, there's all kinds of shit. And it's like, where do we start, where do we begin? And I think we should start at the top because they are the best of the best of the best. Let's talk about the elite, you guys. There's some stuff been going on, and uh, I just want to get right on into it. So let's go for it. Interestingly enough, this kind of ties in with a little bit of my today. I've, as you guys probably have recently heard, had some sync woes on Journey into Comics. I talk about that. But, uh, you know, anyways, we... Uh, We're working on the sink, and today I went to go get under there to check something. I slipped and fucking cracked my knee, and it hurts so unbelievably bad. But while my knee is only hurting a little bit, this is what happened today also, as Cody Rhodes gave us fans uh, and us uh, enjoyers of wrestling an update today, actually, as I record this. Uh, He posted a pic on Twitter, and it says, Surgery completed, went smooth, back to work. Cowabunga, I guess, and uh, he's got a brace on his knee, and he's in a hospital bed, and there's a cup by his bed with a sippy straw, and he just looks as dashing Cody Rhodes as ever, you know. So uh, he had his, he tore his medial meniscus in two places at a Ring of Honor event back in November. He competed at both final battle against Jay Lethal and at Wrestle Kingdom 13 against Juice Robinson before undergoing the knee surgery. Of course, he's been doing a lot of promotional work for getting AEW off the ground, and they had the Double or Nothing press conference. I feel like they've just been doing a lot of press conferences. It was like the the All Elite Wrestling press conference, and now it's the the Double or Nothing press conference, and then the next press conference is probably going to be whatever their following event is. Before we've even had any official matches, they're just doing all this press work, and... Uh, there are some things, I mean, there's several different things I want to talk about. I want to talk about what the Young Bucks have kind of been doing that kind of changed the game a little bit in wrestling. Um, <clears throat> so I guess before we continue on with other things that Cody and all these guys have said and some of the stuff we've got with AEW, I do want to highlight the Young Bucks and talk about them as a tag team. So uh, let's just get into this. You know, those guys are also executive presidents, executive vice presidents or whatever of their brand, All Elite Wrestling. Much like Brando and myself, when we started the network, we were both executive vice presidents, equal shares, equal partners, and upon his leaving the network, it's now become my shit, I guess, and I've got to kind of helm the ship differently, you know, and still delegate. And it, anyways, that's that's my shit. That's not important. Back to these three dudes that are are... are creating all elite wrestling so cody has been doing a lot of the businessy side of things uh brandy is like the the look like the head talent scout for women and whatnot and maybe men too i might be misinterpreting that actually but the young bucks are just taking their they're taking a very them approach 
And what I mean by that is the Young Bucks have thrived on uh, amazingness, unpredictability, and wow factor. Constantly wow factor. So they they have a big draw, a big enough draw. You've heard of the Young Bucks. You know who the Young Bucks are. Like, not the TNA, not not to back to when they were, you know, Matt Buck and, and Nick Buck, the Young Bucks. But, like, Nick and Matt Jackson, the Young Bucks, right? Uh, so these dudes are, you know what could they do in their off time? Because right now they they don't work for ROH, they don't work for New Japan, they're independent wrestlers who own their own company, Who which the company's not there yet. Obviously, they're laying the groundwork. So, looking at it, you think about it, you go, okay, well, what could they do? Well, why don't they go super old school and just start making surprise guest appearances? Not anything that maybe they tease anything but the day of. You know, we're going to be here today. Like, go. And then people are guessing, oh, are they going to go to Knoxville? Are they going to go here? Are they going to go there? So they did, like, a surprise appearance at Defy Wrestling to save Joey Ryan's ass, and that was awesome. And then they, they, you know, they did a little little speech about loving that there's a fresh breath of indie wrestling in the world, and it was a very vibe and scene. Defy Wrestling out of Seattle looked Bitch, and if any of you know about Defy Wrestling, I would love to learn even even more. Uh, but oh, and then we got to talk about Marty too, and that's an important thing that's uh, that's all in a part of this. But then, so the Bucks did the Seattle thing, and I think they did Knoxville, and I think they did Atlanta as well. So they've done like three different surprise appearances. They showed up at Bar Wrestling, like th- they've just making themselves uh, accessible while also being the hottest thing in wrestling. And actually going to places that only have 500 fans packed into an arena or a little fucking gym and making these shocking appearances. And those people are being forever uh, just like pushed into a memory of life where they'll never forget when the when the Young Bucks did these run ins. And um, it just makes that it just makes everything fresh too because it shows that they are willing to work with anybody they don't care and it works better if you can work with anybody cuz they go to a promotion their eyes on that promotion like i wasn't going to talk about defy wrestling on this week's show if they hadn't gone i guarantee you i wouldn't have even looked into it but now i'm like seattle's got a vibrant wrestling scene like i want to see more i'm into that you know so the young bucks are just uh, they're really doing their very best as workhorses for AEW and for their brand, the Elite, you know. And another thing I want to talk about too, and I find interesting, is like how they've done everything. They don't all like they've told you what was going to happen. They laid the groundwork. They literally said on being the Elite, whatever happens next, we're all taking that next step together. We are all taking that next step together. But not all of them have the same exact contract dates. They've all signed to different things and done different things for a certain amount of time. So they've got to wait for contracts to run out before they can officially announce or make their moves. The Young Bucks and Cody had the same schedule with with, uh, New Japan. So when when their contracts were up and we saw the thing on being the elite, you know, the clock striking midnight or whatever, uh, they could say, as well as Adam Page, like, we're going to do this all elite wrestling thing. There's this double or nothing thing like tease, tease, tease and got people talked. It got people hyped and it got people talking and hyped and, and freaking out and getting crazy. And, uh, you know, they, they do that and you're so focused on those four. And then, and then the questions start to come, what's going to happen to Kenny? What about Marty? Like where's flip Gordon? Like all these guys have these different, everyone's on a different agenda. You know, and everybody has a different game plan. And I love how Kenny T's not going to All Elite Wrestling. We're going to get into that in a second. But before we do, uh, I want to say that Cody was talking about his expectations uh, for All Elite Wrestling, for Double or Nothing, the roster and whatnot. I guess he he was a guest on the Ross Report ahead of the ticket party they had in Las Vegas this past Thursday. Uh, given that AEW is still building up to its first event, Double or Nothing, in May, there are still plenty of questions surrounding the budding wrestling promotion. So when uh, you know Cody was grilled by JR, this is what he had to say. Right now I have the building, MGM Grand Garden Arena. 
Me, Matt, and Nick, we scale it for 11,600 seats. Some folks may know some seats may become available because if we thought we had a camera there, we kill that camera, we might open up a few hundred seats. We're aiming to hit uh, 11,600. We want to be honest about our tickets from day one because it's real easy in this day and age to look it up or just talk to the fire marshal. You can't really say we've got 100,000 people in this building anymore unless you have. So Rhodes and the Young Bucks' first self-promoted event all in did uh, 10,000 seats at Sears in Chicago, and they sold out in under 30 minutes. So uh, he also says, we're kicking ourselves over calling it double or nothing. We couldn't find a building that had 20,000 to compete with the 10,000. But this building, it's got wrestling history. I went to WCW pay-per-views here. Matt and Nick did as well, and I'm really excited to bring our fans. Uh, so recently, and this is very important to note, there have been several. We're going to talk about some from the from the announcement party. We're going to talk about some now that have just been announced over the internet. So uh, we had Pentagon Jr. and Phoenix, the Lucha Bros, uh, they're signing with All Elite Wrestling. Uh, Jungle Boy and Jimmy Havoc also signing with All Elite Wrestling. There was a little like, what the fuck's a Jungle Boy? I loved that. I thought that was very clever. As well as Chris Jericho, Pac, obviously. You've got Cody, the Bucks, Adam Page. You've got uh, Britt Baker. Uh, I feel like Tessa Blanchard's going to get signed, but that's just a, a matter of time kind of thing. Uh, so he was talking about the talent, Cody was, and he says, we're looking for a fresh... More than a kind of the equity garnered individual who has perhaps popped around on various television shows already. We're looking for someone who hasn't been seen. That's kind of the directive. Of course, there's folks like Chris Jericho, just an absolute star wrestling freaking rock star. He's done it all and seen it all. But what I want to have is a juxtaposition of somebody on that level seen with somebody who our audience maybe is seeing for the very first time ever. He also said the number of new talent signings will be announced during the event, which it was. We'll talk about that soon. We also got some, well, okay, I don't know which order to actually do this in. Uh, I guess we'll do it in this order because that makes more sense. But uh, as I said, thir before, before we get into this, folks, quick drink break brought to you by Podcastrophe coming tomorrow on the Journey into Comics Network or at podcastrophypod.podbean.com or get them on iTunes to search Podcastrophe. This drink break, again, brought to you by them. Why is water so fucking good, man? We are all water, and that's why. That's the answer. So anyways, the All Elite uh, event for tickets, uh, the ticket announcements for Double or Nothing, the pool party thing they did at MGM Grand Hotel in Vegas was uh, streamed on Thursday. I was watching it while I was driving. Uh, this is just a brief rundown. Cody made his way to the ring, or made his way to the stage to announce AEW would start up a, his, a partnership with Mexican Lucha Libre promotion AAA, it wasn't really that big of a shock, but also kind of a big shock. He then announced that pre-sale signups for Double or Nothing tickets began the night of the, the, the right then in the moment on the promotion's new official website, and the tickets would officially go on sale. They go on sale today for those of you who are listening. They're probably already sold out. My guess is Double or Nothing has already sold out. I'm gonna just predict it here, almost 24 hours before it happens. Double or Nothing gonna sell out in under 24 hours. Double or Nothing's first official match was announced as Adam Hangman Page taking on Pac, formerly Neville for you WWE fans. Pac couldn't make the show, but still cut a promo on Page via a video. Uh, the Young Bucks then came out and announced that the best friends tag team of Trent Beretta and Chuck Taylor, formerly of Ring of Honor in New Japan, would join the company. That was a huge signing. The best friends being signed is an amazing thing for their tag division. So now you've got the Lucha Bros, the Young Bucks... The best friends, okay. So now you 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 in those three teams alone, you could put together a triple threat tag match for the first ever All Elite Wrestling tag titles, and it would blow the fucking roof off of MGM Grand. I'm just saying. But the Bucks were then jumped during this thing by Phoenix and Pentagon Jr., who cut a promo after knocking the two out by saying they wanted to prove they were the best tag team in the world at Double or Nothing. So, again, laying the groundwork, maybe that's where the tag titles are going to be, but then you had the best friends kind of in on that too, so could be utilized. They announced several new female wrestlers being added to the roster, uh, including, I'm going to fuck this up, Yuka Sakazaki, Aja Kong, Kylie Ray, and Nyla Rose. Uh, Nyla Rose, by the way, I do want to mention, 
impressively the first transgender female professional wrestler signed to any major company ever, I do believe, as far as I know, like um, openly. So that's very awesome for, you know, moving forward. Everybody should be able to kick ass in wrestling. It doesn't matter. I don't give a fuck. Listen, it's it's just wrestling. Like It's great. Anyways, after a hype package for the Oriental Wrestling Entertainment Chinese promotion, which was pretty cool, it just showed some of the guys that are coming over, uh, Christopher Daniels and the members of SoCal Uncensored challenge OWE's Kaima to find two of the company's best wrestlers and take them on in a six-man tag match at Double or Nothing. Again, laying the groundwork for what's to come, and I love it. So you've got Phoenix and Pentagon Jr., who are kind of your guys that are getting the call-up from AAA. Obviously, they've already worked all these other promotions and had amazing matches. You don't need to hype on it. We know about it. Like That's a cool thing for AAA, but then you've got this thing with OWE and SoCal Uncensored creating a six-man, and it's like, man, okay, like this is hyped up. All, all like Double or nothing's going to be great. Then we had the final signee announcement of the night, and this is coming into the bigger parts of our, our, our talking points. We're going to get to him in a minute, though. As Kenny Omega closed the show out by announcing he was going to be an executive vice president of the company as well and a full-time member of the roster, meaning now there are four equal vice presidents in AEW. Omega then was approached by Chris Jericho after a brief, fa- after a brief face-off Jericho, like, grabbed Omega's face and pushed him, which led to them quasi-duking it out, and Omega almost got thrown down, like, four stairs, which would have sucked. He almost went into the pool, too, which also would have sucked. It didn't happen, but it was still a very intense match. Uh, And then, uh, of course, ever since All Elite's been a thing, Kenny's not been able to be a part of it or say anything or do anything, and now he's officially joined the party. And because he has officially joined the party, he got to do his closeout, goodbye, bang, and good night. Uh, And it was awesome, man. It was was totally awesome. So Kenny Omega being a latest signee. Also, uh, another new addition to the roster. I totally missed this first part of the live stream. But Sonny Kiss, formerly known as Exo Lucius and Lucha Underground, also was signed. I don't want to forget to mention that he was also signed, which that's also an incredible signee. So I'm looking forward to that, uh, the, the Double or Nothing event. Uh, obviously, they'll probably do the same fight TV pay-per-view stream. Uh, they had a good rapport with them. But before we get into the thing with Kenny, because there's some stuff he said and talking about the future, uh, report that All Elite Wrestling's 2019 schedule weekly TV show start date has been released. This was on the YouTube show Wrestle Talk, which I watch from time to time. They claim to have a source within AEW stating that Double or Nothing is just the tip of the iceberg. The company is also reportedly planning a show for June 2019 somewhere in the U.S. and the unnamed Jacksonville show a month later in July. Then August, the company will travel overseas to an event in Royal Albert Hall in London, England. And allegedly, we will have a September sequel to All In, All Out which hopefully will be uh, coming to you from Chicago, they say. Um, And then after that, they're also going to be announcing their television deal, which will begin its weekly broadcast October 2019. So they're getting right down to business. They're not going to try to start doing a weekly promotion and then do another thing. They're going to do some big events. Boom, double or nothing, all out, whatever it is. You know, AEW, AEW Overseas or whatever they're going to call the London show. The surprise show in June. The show they're going to have in Jacksonville. Like, all these shows every month. Boom, 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 boom. So that by October, when they throw throw the red carpet out for themselves, everybody's already going to be on. They're doing it smart. They're building it. They're going to all these different territories. They're mixing it up. They're working with different promotions and brands and bringing people in and saying, listen, we can have a working relationship. You guys can use our guys. Our guys can use your guys. We can work with each other. If we're doing a big event and we think your storyline can fit into our game plan, we can bring you along. Like, It's great, you know? So none of that has been confirmed, by the way. I will say nothing, none of those events all out being a thing have officially been confirmed. That is conjecture. But it's possible. It is very much possible. Now, let's get back to Kenny Omega and some stuff he said because he was talking about, uh, you know, he did officially sign with All Elite Wrestling last Thursday, which obviously put um, and uh, ru- you know killed. The- he was a rumor killer and got rid of the rumors that he was going WWE and was going to be part of the Rumble or 
obviously the Rumble's past, but, you know, that he was going to at some point show up, maybe a surprise appearance at WrestleMania or whatever, you know. It's funny because I think last year I said some point on one of the season two shows of Journey into Wrestling, I said something to the effect of, like, you know, Omega Jericho on a WWE stage at, say, WrestleMania this year would be huge if, if there were to be, you know, a rematch or something. That's not going to happen, obviously, because Kenny and Jericho are both in AEW, which means there's going to be that match there, which is huge, you know. Um, but Kenny had some nice things to say about the WWE. He said, you know, uh, he was talking to an interview with F4W online and said, the most surprising thing to me was just how accommodating and how cool it was to discuss, you know, the future with WWE. I didn't think they'd ever be in the running. I was like, yeah, I'll hear you guys out. But I didn't think it'd be good because everyone was telling me, well, what to expect. I have nothing to, but great things to say about them. In the end, he put his name on the dotted line, obviously, for AEW. He said in the end, AEW is the best thing for me, you know. It's the most exciting choice I've made in my career. I have, I have it specifically written in my contract that I can go anytime I want and appear for New Japan Pro Wrestling. So he's not gone from New Japan either. He can still do amazing events. Just like I said, working relationship. These guys aren't going to cloister themselves off. It doesn't work that way. WWE, I mean, I guess it does kind of work that way. It's funny because in some ways I relate the network to the WWE a little bit because like, the Journey into Comics network is very in-house. We produce all of our own stuff. Hopefully I'm a good producer uh, anyways, I got a weird, for some reason I got a weird yawn, I think I was talking a little bit too fast and I didn't breathe for a few minutes there, so I'm just going to do some breathing while I talk to you here in this next, I'm going to talk a little more sultry as it were, as Kenny Omega was actually revealing the contracts of his specifics, he said, uh, here's some stuff he said, it's just kind of a little rundown, he said, I remember signing my first contract with New Japan and I was nervous because it was like, wow, a two year contract, that's a lot of time. A lot can change. And now with AEW, I'm signing for four years. And I, it just felt natural. I didn't feel nervous. It's a large contract to me. Largest one that I've signed. But I didn't feel like I was making the wrong choice. And it was cool to feel that way. The cool part, too, is like with the contract, it leaves me very open for a ton of crossover potential. Which is always the most important thing for me. Because I don't necessarily want to be remembered for what I do in the ring. I want to be able to cross over into different kinds of media. I'm going to be able to do my stuff with eSports. I'm going to be able to do all kinds of stuff with ESPN and all that. Some acting stuff. These opportunities now, there's no red tape. It's in my contract where I can freely do these and pursue them, which is great. And that's and that's huge for Kenny Omega, man. He is a megastar. Um, and he's such a megastar. He's so influential, not just to wrestling fans, but to other professional wrestlers. You know, maybe maybe there are some WWE guys that shouldn't be saying the things that I'm about to say, but I'm going to say some stuff because there was some love and outpouring from the WWE community about Chris Jericho v. Kenny Omega happening at Double or Nothing. And uh, it just, uh, let's see, it just seems that a lot of people behind the scenes are talking about, well, uh, you know, double or nothing. And what's going to happen with Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho. And I'm just going to see here. I want to look at something. I want to see if when I go here. I don't know how this works. I don't like the internet sometimes, you guys. I'm just not that good at it. Uh, Jericho. Oh. It was Jericho's Instagram. That's where I need to go, guys. Okay, so I want to just, like, actually go to the Instagram and read you guys what actually was said and not just, like, highlight that somebody else is just saying that he's, you know, whatever. That's not, that's not what I want. Chris Jericho. Oh, Chris Jericho Fozzie is his actual. So... Let's see. I don't know anybody's fucking Instagram names, and they don't. 
What? Ugh. This is this is not what I wanted it to be. Kind of pisses me off. I was just hoping to run through and be able to see a whole bunch of information involving what these people had said, but there's just too many comments, and they don't have them like highlighted by like most important or some shit. I don't know. I'm just gonna kind of scroll through and see if I see any names that I noticed that. Uh, because I know I heard, I was, I feel like, like, Nikki Bella and some other people were hyped on it. And, uh, like I said, of course, you can't ever find anything. But, oh, they'll have a little thingy by them, I think, too, right? I don't know. Anyways, let's not derail the show for a fucking Instagram post, how about? Anyways, let's just say wrestlers on both sides of the aisles are fucking ecstatic for AEW. And AEW's actually been saying that, uh, well, per wrestle votes, it's a, they, they said in their Twitter, they said, seems like the first real shot has been fired. Sources say AEW has made an outstanding offer to a current big-time WWE superstar, an offer that is almost too good to turn down. Things are really about to get interesting. That was on February 5th. So everyone kind of thinks, oh, maybe it's, it's Dean Ambrose. Could it be Dean Ambrose? There's there's actually several other guys. Dolph Ziggler, Rusev. Uh, I'm trying to think of other guys. I mean, AJ Styles technically hasn't re-signed with the company. So I'm not sure, man. Uh, we'll see who ends up. But, you know, I know it's not actually going to be the Revival, and this is a good uh, shifting transition point because... The Revival actually last night walked out of Monday Night Raw as the tag champs. And I feel like this is, well, first of all, it's the first time they've held gold since 2017 when they were NXT tag champs, when they were two-time tag champs, the first time there were two-time tag champs in NXT. That's all very hard to say, two-time NXT tag champs. Anyways. Uh, the Revival's win, though, like I said, it, it, it's kind of a weird timing thing because there had been rumors. There's this fake feud that kind of has been going on between the Elite and, and the Revival. Fuck the Revival and all this stuff or whatever. I'm not really a fan of the Revival, but it's just interesting timing that there were like, oh my god, they're going to go to All Elite Wrestling. They're leaving. They're going to be done with WWE. They've, they've asked to be released. Uh, you know, Hideo Itami was released. Uh, it's like, what the, f you know, all, like all this craziness is happening. And then Dawson and, and Dash win the tag titles on Monday Night Raw, just out of nowhere. So then you just, I mean, sure, you maybe have, or you're trying to create a more interesting feud with Rude and um, Chad Gable, but at the same time, like the Raw tag division's a joke. It's not that great at all. Like, it's bland potato salad is what I'll say so anyways that happened the revival are now your raw WWE tag team champs uh, and, and to continue on WWE it's interesting because we're getting to a point now and I keep saying it that a lot of these people that we admire in sports and in the media and in the world and all these pop culture icons and your professional wrestlers and singers and all that and actors and whatnot we, the younger generation, are going to watch all these amazing, talented folks die. I mean, it's just, a, unless we go first, we're going to watch our, essentially our heroes all pass away at some point. And I'm not necessarily saying this next guy is a hero, but he is a legend that kind of paved the way. Because uh, during a recent SEC filing, the WWE acknowledged two shareholders. They actually know there's some possible downfall if if and when Vince leaves, dies, retires, whatever's happening, whenever it happens. And they said this, uh, in, ad in addition to serving as chairman of our board of directors and chief executive officer, Mr. McMahon leads the creative team that develops the storylines and the characters for our programming, including our television, WWE Network, and other programming and live events. From time to time, Mr. McMahon has also been an important member of our cast of performers. The loss of Mr. McMahon due to an unexpected retirement, disability, death, or unexpected termination for any reason could have a material adverse effect on our ability to create popular characters and creative storylines or could otherwise adversely affect our operating results. Mr. McMahon has established Alpha Entertainment LLC to explore investment opportunities across the sports entertainment landscape 
and Alpha Entertainment LLC plans to launch a professional football league in early 2020, CXFL. While he has provided the company assurances that his focus on WWE will not be diverted by these efforts, any such diversion or perception of a diversion could adversely affect our operating results and could have a material adverse effect on our stock price. So it seems that WWE is very, very aware that Vince is getting up there. He's 73 or 74, 73, and he's not, I mean, he was on screen looking like a badass 20 years ago, folks. He was 53, and that's a different, you're a different person at 53 than you are at 73. I mean, maybe he'll live to 93, but who knows, you know, he's he's an older dude. He's getting up there, and the reality is, is that uh, Vince will go at some point, and H will take over. And Stephanie will take over. And I think, I really think that based on how NXT is ran, based on how NXT operates, based on Triple H's ability to know what a performer wants also because he has been on that side of the field before he was a a part of the McMahon family, you know? Uh, so I feel like he's going to, you know, at the point Vince dies, we're going to see a genuine shift in all of wrestling. Because I feel like everybody's going to start working together to create this like ultra product of just highlighting all the talent. Let guys who are in smaller promotions work their way into the slightly bigger promotions that work their way to the bigger promotions that are working with AEW and New Japan, ROH, WWE, and the like. TNA and all those. And then you have you know minor markets that are building your major markets and your major markets that are being seen globally, which is just drawing more eyes on wrestling which at the end of the day is the only thing we need, folks. And that is the train of our existence. So let's continue on because, man, what a weird... We've got, like I said, we had some wrestling news, and then there, there. I mean, there's not a ton, but there's just some things that are of very, very much importance. And one thing is what happened last night at the end of Monday Night Raw. Well... Let's cap it off with saying what kicked off Raw and what closed Raw was Becky Lynch... And the decision. Becky had to decide, will she or won't she, apologize to Triple H and Stephanie, right? For attacking them, right? Because she was essentially told that she had this knee injury, and they were like, you need to take time off. She's like, I don't want to take time off. And they're like, you need to. You're injured. And she's like, fuck you. I'm fine. And they're like, you need to see a doctor. And they're like, if you don't see a doctor, we're going to suspend you. She's like, I'm not seeing the fucking doctor because I don't want them to take my WrestleMania away. And they said, okay, we're suspending you. And then she attacked Stephanie. And then like on SmackDown, she attacked Triple H showing up after she had been suspended. Very Austin-esque, still showing up after being told you're not supposed to be there. Uh, and then on Monday this week... They came out, she came out, and they're like, our doctors saw you, you're going to be cleared before WrestleMania, so is, if you can just apologize, you can get your match back. And they're like, she's like, okay, i got to think about this. And Becky spent the whole night going around the backstage and asking questions, and should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I. And ultimately, she decided to go to the ring, and she said, I'm sorry, and then she shook Stephanie and Triple H's hands, and, and they said, okay, it's on. You versus Ronda Rousey uh, for the Raw Women's title at WrestleMania 35. It could fucking headline the whole show. I hope it does. Uh, so they were leaving. They leave. Becky's out there. Ronda shows up. Ronda and her are having words. They're building the thing. Vince McMahon's music hits. No chance. That's what you got, Boonu. You know? Cause you got no chance, no chance in hell. Anyways, you guys know it. So Vince came out and he's like, no, no, oh no, oh no, I'm not accepting that apology. Becky Lynch, you can't just walk around here and do it. I've had superstars in the past that think they can get away and do whatever the hell they want, damn it. And you're not one of them. You're not the man, you're a nobody. And, and, and actually, here's the deal, I'm suspending you right now for 60 days. And the 60-day suspension doesn't end literally until five days after WrestleMania. So, Ronda, since you have no opponent for WrestleMania, let me announce someone who is fit to be your opponent and out-walked Charlotte Flair, who he introduced. 
So now Vince is kind of setting up this quasi heel thing with Charlotte where he is siding with her clearly. He's fucked Becky over, esque to the Austin thing. Austin Rock kind of going on here a little bit. And then I guess I guess that makes Ronda like Undertaker, maybe, or something? I don't know. That was I guess that was a weird analogy because I don't know where she would fit in that equation, technically speaking, if we were talking about 90s Attitude Era. But that's kind of, it's very reminiscent of that, this storyline, in, in some ways. But then also, it, it is obviously fresh and totally different. And you got to give everything up to Rhonda and, and Becky because they both are amazingly talented on the mic. They are both vicious and visceral and just brilliant. And it's been a lot of fun to see them interact. So now what we've got is a suspended Becky... And a Charlotte in the match that doesn't belong. What's going to happen, folks? Find out next time on WWE. No, anyways, what's going to happen is it's, it's fairly obvious to me. The plan is this. You insert Charlotte into this match now. So Charlotte's the ha-ha, Becky, I took your spot, you suck. So now Becky's pissed at Charlotte, she has a reason. Becky's also furious with Ronda because she never got that Survivor Series match that she wanted because Nia broke her fucking nose and made her a legend. So all those things combined, Becky is this, like center point. Somehow, some way, I'm not sure what, how, or what way, but somehow, some way, Becky is going to interject herself back into this match officially. She'll be officially a part of this match. It'll be a triple threat. Ultimately, Becky will pin Charlotte, not Ronda, to become the Raw Women's Champion and become more over than the entire rest of the women's division, no offense. She's already there, you know. She's already created her own thing. She's already done her own thing. So now you're just launching her into the stratosphere of, like, legend, like the stratisfaction fear, you know, because you're going to make her on the biggest stage of them all, the champ who defeats Ronda and Charlotte, but Ronda doesn't take the pen because that keeps Ronda from technically having a loss as a singles competitor. She's never been pinned or submitted. And that makes her look tough and like the baddest woman on the planet. Charlotte can lose at WrestleMania, which kind of undoes the fucking that Asuka was given at WrestleMania with Charlotte when Asuka should have won. This is them kind of back-channeling unfucking that. Uh, it's very strange, but ultimately you look at it and you just go, well... This is essentially tonight, the, or last night when I'm recording this, two nights ago when you're listening to this, when Monday Night Raw was this week, was the moment they solidified Becky is going to be the champion at WrestleMania. No questions. There's no if ands, buts, none of that. Guaranteed Becky Lynch champ at WrestleMania. Let's move on, shall we? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, so the, the WWE Universe is fucking mad as fuck. I'm going to read some comments that uh, the comicbook.com folks put together from the WWE Universe, just a good collection, I thought, of people who are not very happy. They're falling into the trap of the WWE because this is exactly what they want. They want you to hate Charlotte on that level. They want her to become the ultimate heel. Because Becky is the over good guy heel who's still a bad guy. So now you have a good guy, a real bad guy, and essentially your middle post, your your anti hero. And again, I, I think it's the most obvious thing to say. The the villain will lose, Charlotte will lose to Becky, the anti hero, um, which will put her again over and, and just really make her. So this is what the WWE universe is saying about what happened. Uh somebody says pathetic. So unnecessary to throw her in this match. Again, we won't see Becky B. Ronda on a 1v1 match. The single most hyped up female match this company has had in years, if not ever. Who knows, maybe this is just a swerve and Charlotte won't end up in the match. <laughs> Somebody else, uh, a, lot of, a lot of gifts, people posting for God's sakes. So, oh, so why have the Women's Royal Rumble in the first place? Someone else says... More like, oh, well, we'll give the fans what they want, but don't doesn't listen to the crowd or listen to them on social media. Decides to listen to his booking staff, which just slowly is draining the company, and this is why Talon is requesting their release. Vince needs to stop. Someone else says, you want to know why adding Charlotte works? Becky and Ronda are baby faces. Charlotte, inserted by Vince, adds a true heel to the mix. I just said that. She has 
name value adds to the marquee. Okay, that makes sense. These are three women provide more potential to the match, spots, and for the first ever main event to WrestleMania. I mean, that is true. That is an interesting way to look at it, that it does almost guarantee they'll be the best. But Ronda Rousey is also not happy. Of course, storyline mode, because she knows what's really going on. But you got to sell tickets, folks. So Ronda on Twitter posted, This isn't what's best for business. This, is what's in this isn't what's in demand. I have no idea what the hell this is. Miss McMahon doesn't believe in his own girl, or doesn't even believe in his own girl, Charlotte, if he doesn't make us the main event of Survivor Series. He's sure as hell not making us the main event of WrestleMania. The women's evolution was robbed tonight. And then it says, For a recap of Raw, check the link in my bio. Way to sell it. Way to sell it back. Way to sell it back. You know, another thing that's been happening is this, like, like the, the talent leaving. That was one thing that had been talked about. And um, the WWE has been spooked because Dean Ambrose is leaving in April. But uh, according to PW Insider, after the Dean Ambrose news came out late on Monday, early Tuesday, a couple weeks ago, there was buzz of activity backstage at SmackDown as anybody who had a contract was coming up in the next year or two was pulled into rooms and spoken to by management about signing longer form deals. All the wrestlers were sitting around looking at each other going, would you look at this? This is crazy. Uh, there is a bit of an exodus to tend to as WWE has already reportedly denied the revival and Mike and Marie Kanellis releases while granting Hideo Itami's exit as we covered last episode. Uh, but in the news of Ambrose wanting to leave when his contract expires in April, WWE... Uh, well, they got the, the, that got WWE's attention, especially with the brand new, well-funded All Elite Wrestling ready to spread its wings. There's definitely a realization that people could potentially leave to go to AEW. WWE might have been paying attention before to it and monitoring it, as Triple H said, but there was definitely a cause and effect between Dean Ambrose making the decision that he is leaving and that news coming out and everybody buzzing about it. And then yesterday at SmackDown, people being spoken to about deals. So, you know, that, when, look, money talks, bullshit walks. They realize people are going to walk out the door. I mean, I've even heard reports. I think I've actually got this on one of my things here. No, I don't. I've actually even heard reports, though, we want to talk about this and touch on this, that they've been offering double contracts. Just like, we'll double your contract, guaranteed, right now. Just don't go. Don't leave. Don't, don't end your deal. And if you're a smart wrestler... You don't sign anything until you're weeks before you're done. Don't negotiate your deal right now. Because now they're, they're, they're just right now trying to give you a good offer. Well, if you wait longer they're really and they really want you, they're going to give you an even better offer. So if you're out there, WWE guys, and you're listening, and they're giving you offers, don't take them. In fact, don't take any offer until you know that it's the best possible thing because I hear AEW is being legit. So anyways, the thing on Dean Ambrose, I want to mention this. He's kind of started to become truly the wild card Dean Ambrose, more uh, old school, because apparently he went off... Uh, yeah, he went off script. On Raw, Ambrose interrupted Seth Rollins' WrestleMania hurrah speech and stood face-to-face -face with the friend turned enemy. Turn friend, turn enemy, and as a Monday friend again. In a tense moment, Ambrose told Rollins he only had one thing to say to him. Slay the beast. And according to Wrestler Observing Radio, this exchange was supposed to be longer, but Ambrose decided to blow past WWE's plans and only deliver the single line. The moment did feel incomplete, but before Rollins could ad-lib his response, Ambrose was out of the ring, taking a seat in a swivel chair. Per the Observer, Ambrose was supposed to mention the Shield and Roman Reigns in an attempt to further galvanize the WWE Universe behind Rollins. While Ambrose didn't execute WWE's plans, his go get him to Rollins did turn him from bad to good in terms of wrestling morality. Ambrose turning face, according to the Zerber, was a preemptive strike by WWE. His fans will cheer him since he's leaving the company. So instead of swimming upstream, WWE is giving fans what they want. One of the things they did to get ahead of the story that Dean was leaving was to turn him face. So that when this uh, happens at the shows, people... Okay, so then what happens at all the shows is people start cheering Dean Ambrose for wanting to leave, which is really weird. Um... But, you know, who knows? Maybe he's playing a game, too, and making this is all just a really long game that WWE is playing. you got to think they've got to be smarter than the smart fans. 
And and it's weird because I feel like as a wrestling fan, you look and you analyze, you look and you analyze, and you're like, what storyline, what's real, what's the middle ground? Because wrestling's hard to decipher like that. There have been moments that have seemed very, very, very real that weren't. There were moments that didn't seem like they were very real at all that were. You know, talking like Matt Hardy and Edge's heat with each other for a minute there is one, one really great example. But, like, maybe they thought, okay, if we tell everybody Dean's leaving and give AEW, like, a, a essentially a big fish to look at, they'll be too distracted to focus on the other things they could be finding. And uh, maybe I'm wrong, but it could just be, this could be all smokescreen, and maybe Dean Ambrose re-signs with the company. I don't know. I tell you, we have an interesting, weird situation as Mustafa Ali was hurt. He has a tailbone injury that's going to keep him sidelined, and will, he will be unable to go and compete in five, in four days now as we're recording this at Elimination Chamber. So since Ali looks to miss Elimination Chamber, that would then knock the field down to Daniel Bryan, AJ Styles, Randy Orton, Samoa Joe, and Jeff Hardy. Uh, however, some people are saying there are four names in the running for the final chamber spot. Going from Andre Cien Almas, which I guess is no longer Cien Almas, just Andre, Rey Mysterio Jr., Shinsuke Nakamura, and Rusev. It is, uh, again, that was actually made official, so, um, but, it, I mean, I, I, it, listen, whoever is going to replace Mustafa Ali at that event does not matter because... And I hate to say it like this. We're going to cover the elimination card here in just one second. The main reason I'm telling you that it doesn't matter who replaces him is because Daniel Bryan wins regardless. So here's the official card as of right now we have. Nia, okay, let's talk about that too as we officially have our, our, our teams for the inaugural Women's Tag Team Championships that will be decided in an Elimination Chamber tag match. For those new titles, Nia Jackson, Tamina versus the Riot Squad, which will com be comprised of Liv Morgan and Sarah Logan, versus Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville, versus the Iconics, versus Bailey and Sasha, versus Naomi and Carmella. Now, next up, we have a tag team championship match for the SmackDown WWE Tag Team Championships: The Miz and Shane McMahon, champs versus the Usos. Should be a interesting, tense. Amazing, brutal match. Uh, Daniel Bryan going into this Elimination Chamber match we just talked about with AJ Styles, Jeff Hardy, Randy Orton, Samoa Joe, Sands, Mustafa Ali, who will probably get hurt in storyline uh, on SmackDown tonight as I'm recording this. It hasn't happened yet, so I'm just going to guess. Um, Buddy Murphy as your Cruiserweight Champion versus Akira Tozawa. Akira Tozawa in a surprise victory here. Good time to switch it up. Ronda Rousey versus Ruby Riot singles match for the WWE Raw Women's Championship. Ruby Riot, the hometown girl from Lafayette, getting a shot at Ronda Rousey. It's R R V R R, so it's uh, reading Rainbow versus um, Red Ribbons. Reading Rainbow versus Red Ribbon. So Bobby Lashley, Bob Lashley, and Leo Rush versus Finn Balor in a handicap match for the Intercontinental Title. Finn Balor wins that match. And in a, just a singles match, Braun Strowman versus Baron Corbin. Wow, how the mighty have fallen. Braun Strowman went from getting a title shot at, at, at the Rumble to facing Braun Strowman in a boring-ass match at Elimination Chamber. Ugh, WWE, way to fuck it up. Anyways, so don't expect uh, Ronda to lose. Uh, don't expect Baron Corbin to l win. Uh, so let's see, I'm going to make the predictions. First tag team champs. Will be the Iconics. Uh, the Miz and Shane McMahon will retain the tag team titles. Daniel Bryan will retain his WWE Championship. Buddy Murphy will lose to Akira Tozawa. Akira Tozawa winning the Cruiserweight title. Uh, Ronda, as I said, Ronda Rousey is going to uh, defeat Ruby Riot. Then you got Bob Lashley and Leo Rush taking on Finn Balor. As I said, I say Finn Balor walks out as champ. And Braun Strowman will beat Baron Corbin. Those are the matches scheduled for this weekend's Elimination Chamber. One guy we know who won't be showing up for sure, Lars Sullivan, who reportedly is just getting deeper and deeper in shit. 
there was a lot of really interesting things that have happened recently, but he apparently went on as his own social media representative and said this, but then removed the post. The post initially said there had been a lot of speculation about Lars recently. It's true. He went missing several weeks ago, and I was just able to contact him this morning. Lars wants everybody to know he is in a good place and is sorry to everyone he's disappointed. The 30-year-old was reportedly set for WrestleMania match with John Cena. However, which with each day he misses, that match dissolves more and more. The rumored plan was for Sullivan to attack Cena, keep him off the Rumble card, which then that turned into Drew McIntyre doing. And uh, Triple H was asked about uh, Lars Sullivan's status before NXT TakeOver a couple weekends ago. Did we, we cover that? Yeah, we did. Uh, and he said there's a lot of speculation stories about everybody at all times. And it's a funny thing. If there's any kind of glitch in a movement for a moment, it leads to everything being speculated about. There's lots of talks, but Lars is in a good place. Nothing has really changed from moving forward, and you'll know when you see it. But nothing has changed. So maybe he's really not missing, but maybe he is missing. Maybe he is having too much anxiety because he's going to, you know, he's essentially going to be a mega heel. I mean, really, he's going to have to go in and be the bad guy against John Cena. And the crowd's probably not going to cheer Lars Sullivan, honestly. Like, it's not necessarily the best position, but I guess he's just... He's not feeling it. He's not feeling confident in himself. And Lars Sullivan has just kind of gone MIA. I tell you, some guys who didn't go MIA, some guys who deserve to be called up, some guys who would run with the opportunity to face John Cena at WrestleMania. Let's talk about this halftime heat match that happened at the Super Bowl. Or not at the Super Bowl, but during the Super Bowl, I guess I should clarify. Velveteen Dream, Ricochet, and Alistar Black. Uh, faced uh, the team of Tommaso Ciampa, Johnny Gargano, and Adam Cole. And Tommaso Ciampa, your NXT champ, Johnny Gargano, the North American NXT champ, and Adam Cole, a member of Undisputed Era. Uh, this whole match was so much fun. It was like 20-some-odd minutes. Uh, it was the second time since, and is a, so the, the first time since for 20 years, okay, first time in 20 years they've done a halftime heat Match the last time, of course, was Mankind defeating Dwayne The Rock Johnson to capture the WWF, the WWF, the WWF Championship. I don't know why I couldn't say that in an empty arena match, which was awesome back then. Uh, so this was cool. It was a solid week for Velveteen G Dream, who won the World's Collide Tournament. Uh, also, he captured the North American Championship from Gargano in an NXT taping, which hasn't happened yet. So Gargano came out with the belt. It was very confusing. I, I guess that's just uh, Velveteen Dream, man. He's He's got to be coming up soon or something. they got big plans for him. I say by this time next year, he'll be on the main roster kicking ass, taking names. Let's talk about that original halftime heat match. Mick Foley actually was doing an interview with ESPN and said, I think a year earlier MTV had had a lot of success doing celebrity death match with claymation figures, one which was Stone Cold Steve Austin, and they'd done a tremendous rating during a halftime of the Super Bowl. Fully remembered. I don't know when the idea came to Mr. McMahon to take that giant audience and kind of keep it for ourselves, but I do remember being asked about it, and then it was my suggestion that The Rock and I do an empty arena match. The fact that I was so completely different than anything on television was so indicative of the chance that we were regularly took. The chances we regularly took. Whether it was on the microphone or in the ring, later on, that really led to great chemistry as a tag team. We were really rolling, and it was understood that The Rock was going to go on to bigger and better things, one of them being a WrestleMania main event with Stone Cold Steve Austin. He, he also says, I do remember hustling through the airport to try to catch the match live on USA Network, so I walked into a lounge in the airport where some guys were watching the Super Bowl halftime, and I can fully said, I convinced them to switch it over to halftime heat, they were really getting into the match up until they hit the rock with a bag of popcorn. Up until that point, I had been taking a pretty legitimate pounding at the hands of the Great One, and they were ooing and aahing. All of a sudden, the popcorn spot happens, and they turn to each other and go, that wouldn't hurt. Maybe in retrospect, I should have found a different devastating object to pummel him with. Yeah, but it was still excellent. Uh, ultimately, I'm pretty sure... I don't know, man. I feel like... Uh, I feel like, I, I, I want to say it was like th two or three 
two or three uh, rock, rock bottoms that, that Mick Foley took in that match, or, or maybe he only took one, but it was it was an intense match, and then he ultimately beat The Rock, and that was really fucking cool, and I, man, I remember that match 20 years ago. That's crazy. It's crazy to think like that. Speaking of rock bottoms, let's talk about this as our kind of closing topic. I want to talk about this as a closing topic because I want it to kind of be separate from everything else because I want to... I want to touch on uh, the world and the bigger picture, right? Only got a few minutes left here on the show, so I wanted to get into something a little bit more personal. Um, Paige recently came out and talked about, well, she talked about how she hit rock bottom, no pun intended, after the sex tapes of her and Brad Maddox and uh, Xavier Woods and so on were released. She said uh, to be publicly humiliated, Publicly humiliated like that was terrible, and I don't wish that for anyone. I didn't go to work. I didn't do anything. I felt so rock bottom. Um, but as she hinted in her episode of the WWE Chronicle documentary s- series, Paige began to turn things around after a chance encounter with a young fan. She explained that one random day while at a grocery store in Texas, she was approached by a female man who was only about seven years old. Of course, she didn't have the internet and thought I was the most beautiful and most successful woman in the world. It opened my eyes to so many things. I was like, I'm going to let videos get in the way of things. I thought, what am I doing? I need to be successful for her. My whole journey was supposed to be about inspiring people. Um, when Paige was finally cleared to return to in-ring action in September 2017, uh, she you know, obviously appeared as the new faction leader of Absolution, and then she was injured, and that injury ended her career. She then became a part of the company and has been doing stuff on SmackDown ever since. Now, why did I bring that up? Why did I talk about her situation and and these sex tapes? Because here's the facts, guys. Um, Most grown adults, and people are going to be, like, pissed off, you know, but most grown adults at some point have probably taken a nude photograph and sent it to their significant other, to someone they were courting, received one from a significant other or someone they were courting, you know, or some inner combination of the two. Um, With that being said, though, you know, you got to think that we're all adults. If I mean, for the most part, if you're listening to this, you're probably an adult. And you shouldn't judge somebody because they had dirty, kinky sex. Because that's their business. That was their experience. You're watching it and you're getting off on it or you're talking about it or theorizing about it or speculating why she did what she did or any of these things. Here's the facts. Paige was a female in an up-and-coming company who in NXT at that time, they were changing the way things worked and they were trying to be – and I'm not saying they were fucking. That's not what I'm – not everybody was fucking. But I'm saying the culture down there was changing at the time she was down there and – People were grouped together, and if you had a small clique of people, um, it's not surprising that if there were several single wrestlers that were all there hanging out and, you know, with each other all the time, that little flings started happening and stuff. And in wrestling, it's wrestling, you know. Uh, So if you get into an intimate thing with somebody and then it doesn't work out and you still have to work with them, it makes things awkward, as Paige has found out on several occasions. Uh, But... I feel like, uh, you know, I just feel like we need to get past this. Like, I, I, I heard there was another, like, Tony Storm or something. She's a female pro wrestler that's in WWE. She did the Mae Young Classic this year. She had some pictures leak and shit, and it's like, if you're a fan and you're looking to get these people and do this to them, why? What are you trying to gain? Ultimately... You're servicing yourself because, sure, oh, I got to see him, fuck, that's hot, whatever, okay, sure. But you're you're just hurting other people, though. You're hurting a real person. See, the character Paige is just a character. Like, she's a real human being. The person of Seth Rollins, he's just a character. The person of of uh, Vince McMahon is, is, is both a character and the real person, and the lines blur there, you know? And I feel like we should all just come together and be like, look, if a girl wants to show her body off to another dude and dirty pictures and videos want to be made, that's fine. But it doesn't need to be shit that needs to be leaked and fantasized and hyped and, and over, overly discussed and talked about on uh, the internet. Because 
it just creates a gross culture of men like oh yeah I, I deserve to see that like you really don't like maybe those sex tapes were made for them to enjoy with each other or maybe when they weren't together and on the road they would do that kind of stuff because they liked spending time like, there's all these different things that could be happening you know you guys don't know the ins and outs of relationships you know i, I kind of take that personal when people assume situations they're not a part of and then judge it's 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 shitty so don't be like that. Guys, I was getting ready to get out of here and uh there was a, there's a you know, there's a couple pieces of news that just came loose. Uh Seth Rollins just posted on his Instagram and said, "Should I just start swearing in my post just to seem super edgy?" Nah, not that desperate for likes just yet. And then apparently uh, oh, it's because, oh, that's why, okay. So, I see what happened. Okay, so apparently, Becky posted yesterday complete and utter bullshit. Like, no censored herself. She said complete and utter bullshit. And apparently, there have been some talks of... WWE hyping back up to uh, PG-13 with the Fox deal coming through. You know, Seth Rollins, if you want to cuss, cuss, man. I think it's funny that they're just fake beefing each other because they're just giving each other shit. But you guys, that was just like a brief, like, ha-ha moment. Whatever, it's funny to see those two mocking each other. But there's some real news that broke. As Tuesday, according to WWE.com, WWE Hall of Famer, former WWF heavyweight champion, Pedro Morales, has died at the age of 76. Now, the WWE extends its condolences to the Morales family, friends, and fans. Uh, a native of Puerto Rico, Pedro Morales, best known from his time in the World Wide Wrestling Federation from 1970 to 75, and again from 1980 to 1987, his only reign as world champion from 1971 to 73, Morales held what would eventually become the WWE Championship for 1,027 consecutive days. Morales made his wrestling debut at age 17 in 1959 and initially rose to popularity in the World Wrestling Association promotion in California starting in 1965. He held the WWA World Heavyweight Championship twice and the World Tag Team Championships on four occasions with four different partners over the next three years and in 1970 signed with Vince McMahon Sr. to join the WWF. He won his first title with the company, the WWF, the WWF United States Heavyweight Championship. In 1971, by defeating Freddie Blassie and capturing the WWF World Heavyweight Championship from Ivan Koloff just one month later. Throughout his reigns, Morales, the first Latin American world champion in WWF history, worked with the likes of Ray Stevens, Stan Stasiak, Blue Demon, Ernie Ladd, George the Animal Steel, Mr. Fuji the Sheik, and even Bruno San Martino. Morales dropped the title to Stasiak in December of 73, who held it for just nine days before dropping it to San Martino. Uh, but Morales was far from finished. After since the NWA AWA Championship Wrestling from Florida New Japan Pro Wrestling, Morales made, made his way back to the McMahon's promotion, now the World Wrestling Federation, in 1980. After winning the WWF Tag Team Championships in 19 in, in which in with Bob Backlund in April of that year in 80, uh, Morales became the first wrestler in the company to ever become a Triple Crown Champion as he won the Intercontinental Championship from Ken Patera. In December of 1980, no wrestler would become a Triple Crown Champion again in the WWF until Bret Hart won the WWF Championship from Ric Flair in 1992, so a whopping 12 years later. Morales still holds the records for most days as Intercontinental Champ at 619 across two reigns. The Miz is close to breaking Morales' reign at 599 days, uh, though he has held the title eight times. After retiring from uh, in ring work in November of 87, Morales worked as a Spanish language commentator for both WWF and WCW. He was named to the WWF Hall of Fame in 95 alongside the Grand Wizard, Fabulous Mula, Ivan Putsky, Steel, Lad, and Antonino Roca. Man, it's sad to see that uh, Pedro Morales has passed away, folks, but uh, as I said earlier, we're destined to see our heroes all. All fade away, man. They all go away in the end. But uh, this is the end of Journey into Wrestling. You guys can check us out every other Wednesday right here on the Journey into Comics Network at journeyintocomics.com. Get us on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher Radio, Google Play Music, CastBox, Spotify. 
Just search Journey Into Comics Network, hit the subscribe button, or patreon.com backslash journey into comics. Give us a buck for early access and exclusive content. I want to thank you guys so much for checking out this week's episode of Journey Into Wrestling, Season 3, Episode 14. We will see you guys later.